Hi everybody, thank you for stopping by. Today I've got two really mysterious and creepy stories for you. And I hope you enjoy them. Something happened to me over 20 years ago that still sometimes haunts me. I still have a bad dream about it once in a while. My name is Teresa, and it was back in late 2000 that I was offered the most amazing position. This was the job I'd been dreaming of, but I never actually thought I'd get it. Well, at least not so soon. Now, I was only 28 years old at the time, and I didn't expect an opportunity like that for at least another 10 years. And this was a huge opportunity for me, so I was definitely willing to relocate for it. The company that I would soon be working for was so great. They were nice enough to help me find a nice house to rent, so I wouldn't even have to worry about that. In the last few days of January 2001, I relocated. I moved from Delaware to Connecticut. Now, I hated moving in the winter, but I was so pleasantly surprised by the nice little house that the person in Human Resources found for me. They chose a very nice three-bedroom home, much bigger than I actually needed, but it was beautiful. It was less than 10 minutes from work, and if all that wasn't enough, the company actually paid my security deposit and three months rent in advance. Like I said earlier, this was a dream job. So I moved in and I did my best to get comfortable in my new surroundings, then officially started my new job in the last week of February. The weeks went by, then the months, and everything was falling into place. I was now more familiar with my neighborhood and the city I worked in as well. Everything was going along without any problems at all. If I had one very small complaint, it was only that I was beginning to feel like I was in a bit of a rut. It seemed like for me it was just work and home and work and home. I didn't have any social life to speak of, but I told myself that I just needed to be patient. It was early summer and I'd only been there about four months, and perhaps over the summer I would make friends. Well, one Saturday morning, the landlady, Jenny, stopped by to meet me and see if everything was okay. She wanted to ask if the home needed anything. She really was one of those great landlords, the type that aren't too intrusive and at your door every month, but she was also a responsible landlord. Well, we talked for a while. She gave me her phone number in case I needed anything. She was really very nice and helpful. Well, since she was there, I decided to ask her a few things I was curious about. My rental home sat on a lot that appeared to be roughly about a quarter acre, maybe a bit less. But as it turned out, I was really wrong about that. Jenny explained that that's only the part that she had fenced in. She explained that that fenced in part, I was right about. It's about a quarter of an acre, just as I thought. But the property is actually just over eight acres total. So about two acres on each of the four sides of the property. So I asked Jenny... If she owned about eight acres total, who owned the rest of the land? Because I could see there was a lot more property than that. She explained that adjacent to what she owned, there was about 30 acres to the left and another 30 acres to the right. And then to the rear of the property was at least another 200 acres behind the house. I explained to her that I wanted to know because I was thinking about maybe taking a walk through there. But I didn't want to trespass or have any neighbors upset with me. And Jenny told me it would be fine if I wanted to walk through there. She said that she's never seen anybody on that land. It wasn't being used for anything. She didn't think anybody would complain. She mentioned that on the largest parcel of land to the rear of the house, on the opposite side, there was an old building. It used to be a clothing manufacturer years ago. She said it was shut down in the early 90s and now just sat vacant. She warned me to be on the watch for snakes. So the next weekend, it was really nice out, and I thought it would be a good idea to get out of the house for a while. Just get some fresh air and exercise. So I went walking behind the house in the woods. And Jenny was right. I could tell right away nobody ever goes to this area. There was no clear path at all. I got the idea to start marking my route. So I went back to the house, and I cut up some ribbon, so that I could mark the path I was making. As I'm walking, I don't know for sure one way or the other whether I'll be back out walking again. 
Maybe after one good walk I'd lose interest. But I did go ahead and tie a piece of neon pink ribbon on a branch about every ten feet or so, and as I'm walking I'm occasionally clearing away a large rock or a fallen branch in the attempt to start creating a pathway. I've been walking less than 15 minutes when I came upon this small area that was just plain dirt and rocks. There was no vegetation of any kind in this spot. This dirt area looked to be roughly about 8 foot by 10 foot, which I know sounds kind of small, but everywhere else was so thick with trees and bushes and weeds that this little area really stuck out. In the center of this dirt patch there was this puddle of water. This puddle struck me as being odd. This dirt clearing was completely bone dry, yet right in the center was this puddle. It was maybe about two feet across, and it was pretty shallow, maybe two to three inches of water. What was strange about this was that the puddle was filled with these items, items that didn't seem to go together. There was an old doll, a small wooden toy block, and the paint on the letters was almost completely gone. It was a toddler-sized girl's shoe, and of all things, a framed image of the Virgin Mary, broken rosary beads, and what appeared to be some old wooden puzzle pieces. What strange things to find, I thought. And I stood there looking at what I found, because I thought how odd it was to see such a odd collection of old items. Things that didn't seem to go together. And I continued on my walk. Well, little did I know that finding that puddle with all those old items, well, I guess it turned out to be a stroke of bad luck. I walked until I ran out of the pink ribbons in my baggie, and I walked for about 45 minutes total. And when I got back home, I felt really good. And I knew it was the walk that had given me the high energy I was feeling. And I decided that I'd try to walk some more. I wound up having something to eat, and then I was watching TV in the early evening. Well, that's when I started to smell something so horrible that I actually struggled not to throw up. To me, it smelled like a combination of rotting meat, bad fish, rotten eggs, and kind of an earthy smell like dirt. I got out some room spray, but that didn't make it any better. In fact, it may have made it worse. I thought maybe an animal had died under the house. Maybe that's what I was smelling. I couldn't understand why that nasty odor seemed to come and go, randomly and so suddenly. That part made no sense to me. After about ten minutes or so, I realized that that horrible smell was now gone. And I was relieved, but I thought it was very odd that it just went away like that. I never experienced anything like that before. I started thinking about what it could possibly be, and I ruled things out one by one. It really didn't add up. The rest of the night was fine, but then in the middle of the night, that nasty smell was back, and it was actually worse than the first time I smelled it. It actually woke me up. I started to think that maybe it was coming from the AC vents. So I paid attention to when the AC came on, and then I started going from vent to vent to see if I could smell anything bad. And it wasn't that. How weird for a smell to come and go so randomly. And so incredibly strong. And then it would just go away 10 or 15 minutes later. It happened a few times and then not again for another 5 or 6 days. It wasn't happening very often, it was just weird. Well, one day after work, I decided to order a pizza for dinner. Jenny had recommended a place that she liked, and they delivered. So, I find something to watch on the TV, and then I dig into my pizza as soon as it arrived. After I ate, I took the box into the kitchen. On the counter in the kitchen, there sat the old wooden block that I'd seen on my walk in the woods, in the puddle, and a length of that neon pink ribbon that I'd cut. Now, I didn't have any more of that ribbon cut, and I didn't have any lengths left around. Someone had untied one of the pieces that I tied to a branch and left it in my house. Now, this is when I got extremely nervous. I didn't touch any of the items in the puddle that I'd seen. Someone else had to do that. I had an intruder, I thought. 
I looked all over the house, and I was terrified. But I searched, and nobody was there. More importantly, I couldn't find any sign that anyone had been there at all. The doors and windows were locked. No signs that anyone had attempted to break in. There weren't any scratch marks on the doors, the handles, nothing. There were no footprints outside. Other than the appearance of the wooden block and the pink ribbon, there wasn't a single sign that anybody had been in my house or had even attempted to get into my house. This didn't make sense. Right from the moment that I saw that wooden block and that pink ribbon that came from the woods into my house, well, everything was different after that. For months after that, things got very strange, disruptive, and even very frightening at times. Either I was losing my mind, or something paranormal was happening. Over the next few months, at least three or four times every week, I was woken up in the middle of the night by scratching and even knocking sounds from under my bed. I was terrified. I felt like a frightened child. It's hard to put into words exactly what this kind of activity feels like when it's really happening, when it's not just something you're watching in a movie, when it's happening and you're the only one in your house all alone. I tried simple things like moving and sleeping on the sofa, but it didn't matter where I was. It seemed that something really wanted my attention. The noise wasn't every night, but it was often enough to make me very uncomfortable. Even on the nights that were quiet, I couldn't relax because I never knew when something was going to happen. So I was always nervous. There were these times that I would find the little pieces of pink ribbon that I used to tie to make a pathway in the woods. Oh, how I hated finding those little pieces of ribbon. They just terrified me. I came to believe that this had to be a spirit, but who? Of course, I couldn't even begin to take a guess. I tried speaking out loud to the spirit in my home. One weekend, I even took a walk back into the woods, and I hadn't been there since that very first walk I took, and I was surprised that when I arrived at the clearing, the puddle was still there. It was still dry all around it, and it looked exactly like the first time I'd seen it only minus one wooden toy block. I spoke out loud in front of this puddle, but nothing changed. I didn't know what it wanted, and I couldn't do anything to make it stop. I wasn't comfortable or happy anymore. The situation was making me miserable and fearful. I wound up calling my landlady, Jenny, but she didn't know what to say to me. She never told me that she didn't believe me, but she did say that she'd never had anyone else ever make any complaints or mention anything of that nature. I tried ignoring it, but that just didn't work for me. How can you ignore something like this? Instead of stopping or happening less, I felt that things that frightened me were actually getting worse. Now, I was never physically harmed in any way, but I was so tired and I was starting to feel depressed. I was sick of always being afraid in my own home. One day, just as I was arriving home from work, I had just pulled into my driveway when suddenly my back car door opened all on its own. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't see a thing. But then I heard breathing. That terrified me. That car door opening sent me running inside the house. Then once inside, I was worried about what might happen next. I guess that was the day I had just had enough. That car door opening, then hearing that heavy breathing, well, it just scared me to death. It made me feel like no place was safe. Something that I couldn't see had the ability to pull open on a car door. Well, that just scared the hell out of me. I spoke with Jenny, and she was so nice and understanding. Now, I don't know if she believed me or not, but she was kind. When I explained to her that... I couldn't take it anymore. I had to move. I told her I might have to either break the lease early or extend the lease by a couple months, depending on the situation. Well, Jenny couldn't have been any nicer. She told me not to worry about the lease, but she was very sorry to see me leave. 
So was I, but I couldn't live with so much anxiety and fear. I wound up finding a suitable home, and then I moved out in April the following year. After I left there, I didn't have anything else that I would consider to be odd or disturbing happen once I moved out. About five or six years after all this happened, I told this story to a few friends that I'd made one night. One of my friends asked me, didn't a little girl go missing in that area like 20 years ago? And of course, this was not my hometown. I wouldn't know anything about that. I was relatively new to the area. But this friend's question about the girl really nagged at me. So the following week, I made a call to the state police. They did listen to me, but I have no idea if they took me seriously or even followed up on it. I don't even know if what happened was actually related, but I felt like I did what I could. I was hoping just by making that call that would be giving something to that spirit, if that's what it was. I thought about that house and what happened so many times, and if that same thing happened now, honestly, I don't think I'd do anything different. I'm older, so I'd like to think I'd be a little less frightened, but who knows. Whoever the spirit was, I really do hope that they found peace. Out of curiosity, I did do some research, at least as much as I could. I never did find any cases for children or adults that were ever linked to the property that I lived at. So I don't think my experience had anything to do with any missing persons cases. Anyway, that's my one big paranormal experience that I had to deal with, and to this day, if I see a little wooden toy block or a pink ribbon, either of those two things will remind me of that experience. My name is Anne, and my husband's name is Frank, and we have a son named Tyler. And this is something that was both paranormal and stressful that our family went through years ago. This started when Tyler had just turned six and our family had already been living in our home for over five years without anything unusual happening. My husband and I purchased the home when Tyler was just an infant. He was only about three months old at that time. And Tyler was born in 2001 and we bought our house that same year. Everything in that home was just fine. The entire time we'd been living there, no problems at all. We only had to do a minor amount of work when we first moved in. Just a small amount of remodeling. Minor things like paint. Everything went smoothly, and since Tyler was just a baby, he was completely unaffected by whatever we did. So, what happened in 2007 was sudden, and there's nothing I can think of that would have prompted it. One day, out of nowhere, my son started saying that he was very tired, and he was acting like he couldn't keep his eyes open. I couldn't recall ever seeing Tyler that tired before. He always slept very well and always had a very high level of energy. So I just kept an eye on him, just in case he was coming down with something. Well, the very next day, he complained about being tired again, and he was complaining that he couldn't sleep. He was saying that somebody was making a lot of noise through the night. Somebody was crumpling up papers, he said, and he can hear it through the night. Tyler was thinking that his dad and I were making the noise. Well, after hearing that same thing from my son two days in a row, I told him that that night I was going to lay with him in bed and we would figure it out. So I was laying with him in his bed for a while, and I was actually about to fall asleep when I began to hear something. Tyler heard it too and turned to me. He asked me if I heard it and I shook my head in confirmation. I didn't say it to him. But that wasn't paper being crumpled up. What I heard was whispering. Now, I couldn't make out what was being said, and I had no idea who was talking, of course, but it absolutely was a voice I was hearing. But I let Tyler believe it was just crumpling paper or something similar. I didn't want to scare him. Nobody in our family has ever dealt with any mental health issue or any physical condition like a hearing or a vision problem or any other physical health issue that would explain what we were experiencing. To deal with the noises at night, 
I decided to try to cover the disturbance with white noise. I put a fan in my son's room, and then I kept the TV on low. The noise from the fan and the TV definitely helped. Tyler was getting a lot more sleep. But the whispering was still there. I heard it. But at least Tyler was focused on the other noises, so the situation at least had a band-aid on it. I had no idea what I was hearing or where it was coming from. The only thing I knew for sure was it was a voice. Neither could Frank. He and I talked about it, and he even made the point that I couldn't have been hearing a neighbor talk. Our closest neighbor was well over 500 feet from us, so he didn't think it was any outside noise. Because the sound at night was continuing every single night, I had Frank go in and lay with Tyler. I wanted to make sure he heard it too, that it wasn't just me. Well, the TV was still helping Tyler sleep, but Frank did hear it. He slept in Tyler's room, he heard it too, and now he was just as curious as I was and wanted to solve this little mystery. He dug out a little voice-activated recorder to see if he could capture the sounds. He put batteries in, tested it, and took it with him to go lay down with Tyler at night. Well, Frank heard the whispers, but when he played the recording back that he thought had picked it up, there was nothing there. And it appeared that the batteries were dead. Well, I double-checked the date on the package that the batteries came from. They should have been just fine, and not even close to being expired. Frank tried it again, that night with batteries that he went out and purchased, only to get the same outcome in the morning. Well, Frank really wanted to put the end to this, so he actually went out, bought a brand new recorder, brand new batteries, and yet the same thing happened again. The mystery was actually getting stranger. I think this was when we started to entertain the possibility that this could be paranormal. We couldn't believe that's what we were thinking, but what other direction could we go in at that time? And then things changed. At first we saw something, then we started to piece it all together. It kind of felt like paranormal connect the dots. So what happened was, one day I saw this hand, this strange disembodied hand, reach around from the other side of our refrigerator, and it looked exactly like a real human hand. It wasn't transparent, it wasn't ghostly looking, it looked just like a person's hand. I don't mean it was a shadow, and I don't mean it looked similar to a hand. I mean it was a hand. But nobody was in the house except for me at that time. I went over to the fridge, which was very close to where I already was standing, only about 10 feet, maybe less from where I stood, and there was nothing there. Nothing. I told myself I had to have imagined it. In fact, I didn't even mention it to Frank. Well, the following day, during the afternoon, I heard Frank cussing like a sailor for some reason. I wanted to make sure that he didn't hurt himself or anything serious happen, so I went to look for where he was. And as I was looking for Frank, he was on his way to get me and we met in the hallway. And he yanked me into our room. He told me he didn't want to scare Tyler, but he had something to tell me. He looked upset. Frank told me, that I was probably going to think that he was losing his mind. Well, what, I asked him. Tell me. Frank said that when he was coming back in the house after having a smoke out on the deck, just as he was coming in and shutting the door, he saw a hand. And he explained it pretty much the way I just did to you, saying that it looked exactly like a real person's hand. Frank said it looked like someone was hiding under our kitchen table and was reaching up from underneath the table to grab the edge of it. Frank was very upset. I didn't want to make matters worse. Frank seemed even more upset about seeing the hand than I did, so I made the decision to delay telling him about the hand that I saw, and I was just hoping that it wouldn't happen again. And then a day later, things actually started getting worse. This time it was Tyler who was now seeing the out-of-place hands. The first time that Tyler saw it, he screamed so loud, and he actually fainted or passed out 
from the fear, the screaming, or both. Frank and I knew that we had to do something. We had to do something quickly. We couldn't just let this keep going on and getting worse. If we couldn't resolve what was going on, we'd have to sell the house. We couldn't have Tyler being afraid in his own home and growing up like this. So we started reaching out to friends and family members, asking everyone to brainstorm for Tyler's sake. That turned out to be a bit of a mistake because everyone had their opinions on how we should handle everything. We actually got way too much advice. We knew that everyone meant well, but we were becoming overwhelmed, not only by the strange things that were happening, but we were also worried about our son and we were now being bombarded by different opinions and advice. We were stressed and confused and worried, and we were especially worried if we chose the wrong way to handle it, it could only get worse. Well, we had several long discussions, and eventually Frank and I thought that a traditional blessing by a priest would probably be the most conservative approach. We didn't want to make things worse. Maybe we were a little too conservative, though, because it didn't work. Nothing changed. In fact, things started to get worse. It now felt like we were experiencing poltergeist activity. In addition to occasionally seeing hands in odd places and the noises at night, the whispering, now we started to hear knocking noises, and objects were either being knocked over, moved, or falling. There were knocking sounds, like on the walls. Occasionally, lights would flash on and off. And a variety of things that were very abnormal to us were happening in our home. Things were getting really noisy sometimes, and we were no longer comfortable there. In fact, I think I can speak for all of us. We didn't want to live there anymore. We'd had enough. After about a year of this, and even trying a second blessing with a different priest, there was still no change. I came up with a plan, and Frank thought it was a good idea. Our plan was to buy another home. And then, if somehow our credit got destroyed because we couldn't sell the home, and it got foreclosed on, we'd at least have another roof over our heads. Then, before putting our current house on the market, we would do everything we could to cleanse that house. We would try everything we could since we wouldn't be there if things got worse, so we were willing to be less conservative about it. We also didn't want to be those people who passed on their problems to others, so we definitely intended to do all that we could. Well, after a couple of months, we found a home that we really liked. It was in our budget. So we moved out of our old home and got settled into the new house. And then we started to look for what our next move would be to cleanse that house. It wasn't something we really wanted to deal with, but like I said, we didn't want to be those people. We couldn't sell it knowing what we went through in that house. We didn't want to pass that on to somebody else. We had to move fairly quickly. We couldn't afford to pay two mortgages for very long. We never got to meet with any realtor. A for sale sign never got put up on that property. Our former home wound up being leveled. It was almost nine weeks after we moved out. A natural gas leak caused an explosion and a fire. The fire inspector said that we were incredibly lucky that we had moved out in time and that the home was empty, saying that it was doubtful anybody would have survived such an explosion and fire. In hindsight, Frank and I really do believe that someone scared us out of that home, possibly one of our grandparents that passed away. The timing of everything just seems to be too much of a coincidence. We lived in that home for about six years. Nothing happened until just weeks before that explosion. We don't know what others might think, but that's what we believe. And it's taught us something. It taught us that if something does happen that seems scary, well, maybe it can turn out to be a blessing in disguise. We now call it our guiding hands, and we sometimes still talk about it. We didn't know this until it happened to our house, and when we learned about it, we were actually shocked. And I bet most people don't know about this. We found out that 
well over 250 homes in the U.S. experience an explosion or serious fire due to a natural gas leak every single year. We had no idea about this. We had no idea it happened so often. We thought it was a rare thing. Now, we aren't automatically terrified by something we think may be paranormal. Not all unusual activity has to be evil. We feel that our paranormal experience saved our lives, and we're so grateful. We hope our guiding hands are still keeping an eye on us. Okay, guys, that's all I've got for today. But you know I'll be back really soon with more stories. Do me a favor and hit that like button before you leave. And keep those comments coming because I love them. Alright guys, until the next time, everybody stay safe and keep your eye out for the scary and the strange. Alright guys, bye for now. Take care.